I'm uh, recording the presentation now. Great. Um, oops. So uh, today's uh, meeting, uh, the agenda is shown here. Uh, we'll have a few opening remarks from Keith Elliston. Welcome to 2016. Uh, Rudy's going to talk about the 2016 training program, which is coming together nicely. Um, John O'Hara and probably the rest of us will talk about the development roadmap and what's going on now. And then Peter Rice will be joining us a little later um, to talk about the curated data um, that's available for Transmart from, from the wiki page and elsewhere. Um, we, we wanted to have a, a session that focused a bit more on data rather than on functionality, which is what we usually do. So, um, and in particular, at the end, I've tried to leave enough time so that uh, we can have a discussion with the community about other data types and other data sets that you'd like to have access to, and or uh, whether there's any data out there that, that you can contribute uh, to the rest of the community. So, so that's the agenda. Um, let me see if Keith is on. Uh, I'm not sure. Keith, are you on? We may have to skip and come back to him. Um, so, Rudy, why don't we jump in and uh, and talk about the training program then? Rudy, you're muted, right? There we go. Sorry, Keith, can you hear me? Oh, oh there's, there's Keith. There's Keith. Okay, we'll do him. Yeah, I had a little trouble getting on the webinar. Sorry. Oh, okay. <coughs> oh. Are, you, are you ready to go, Keith? Yeah, I can uh, just give a quick update. And go ahead. Okay. You want to just send it over to me, Keith? Oh, sure. I can do that. Yeah. Unless you have my slide. Yeah, I'll make. I'll make you the presenter for the moment, and then. Uh, okay, that works for me. All right. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, just wanted to give a, a quick uh, welcome to 2016. Uh, it's going to be a, a busy and exciting year. Uh, I'll just remind people that the foundation is on a fiscal year. We actually go July to June. So this is uh, the start of our third quarter. And we'll have our quarterly board meeting coming up on the 26th, uh, where we'll be uh, presenting a number of things around the roadmap and, and talking about various things that we're doing there. Uh, but a lot of uh, a lot of activity coming in 2016 as we focus on uh, really this uh, research grade to commercial grade uh, transition and, and phasing with the platform. Um, as I mentioned, our board meeting uh, on the 26th. This will be one of our virtual board meetings. The board meeting coming up uh, in the spring will be here in Boston on site. We have two on site and two virtual meetings every year. Uh, and if you have any questions about the board meeting or whatnot, you know, please let me know. Uh, we're making a lot of progress on the roadmap. John is going to give you a little bit of an overview, uh, but uh, we've been uh, having a number of discussions and presentations with various people on the, the roadmap. I've gotten some, some great feedback, which we're incorporating in what we're doing. Uh, John will take you through the 16.1 uh, the release, which is uh, happening uh, end of March, the 16.2 release, which will be in the second half of this year, and the 17.1. Uh, just a reminder, 16.1 is in the release cycle, 16.2 is in the development cycle, and 17.1 is in the specification part of the cycle. Uh, so a lot of progress on the roadmap and, and moving things forward on the platform. Uh, we're also making a, a lot of progress on the content side. Uh, we had a, a, a large number of data sets that were donated to the foundation at the annual meeting. Uh, Peter Rice uh, and Rudy Potenzone and Julie Bryant have been doing uh, some great work on the content committee in making these data uh, uh, appropriately formatted and ready for use. Um, you'll see Peter will take you through a lot of detail on that in, uh, in our meeting today. Uh, but it's, it's really great. If there are groups that have uh, Transmart Foundation or Transmart Platform formatted data uh, that's curated and you want to make publicly available, uh, please uh, let either Rudy Potenzone, Julie Bryant, or Peter Rice from the content committee know, and uh, they can add you to the list and make these data available. Uh, when we go through the roadmap, John will tell you some of our plans uh, for making that data easier to load and easier to integrate in the platform uh, as we go forward in our development process. On the community side, uh, the community committee has been uh, very active. 
Uh, we actually have a hackathon uh, going on this week. Uh, the Hive is uh, sponsoring a hackathon around Smart R with people from Luxembourg, etc. Uh, so a lot of a uh, lot of good activity there. Uh, we're working diligently, uh, as Rudy will tell you, uh, towards uh, what we're doing with the bio IT world uh, coming up, and then uh, precision medicine meeting uh, here in June uh, in Boston. Uh, so a lot of activity on the community committee as well. One of the key things that has been important to us and will be important to us through the year is uh, how we manage licenses and intellectual property. Uh, one of the key challenges for us has been uh, finding the right kinds of advising on this. And I'm happy to say that uh, we we found a, a great new advisor, uh, Karen Koppenhaver uh, from Choate, who is also the general counsel for Linux Foundation, uh, has been uh, meeting with us and helping us with some of our IP strategy. And so you'll be hearing more out of what we're doing there, out of the Legal Affairs Working Group. Uh, Jamie Katisha, uh, who chairs that as a, a bioinformatics expert and IP attorney, and uh, he and Rudy and Karen and I with John are, are working on uh, assessing what we're doing on licensing and IP front. So you'll hear a lot more on that. We've also been doing uh, a lot of work around alliances. Uh, we have have some, some great discussions ongoing with the Pistoia Alliance. Uh, people will remember that the Transmart Foundation was, in fact, uh, spawned from the Pistoia Alliance. And we're now working on some collaborative ways to partner and, and move some things forward. Uh, we're also working uh, closely now with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And uh, we've become a member of the Data Working Group. And we're working through uh, a lot of the key ways in which genomic data and genomic information will be uh, loaded, uh, stored, and accessed, and analyzed within the Transmart platform. Key aspect of what we're doing in the roadmap, and, and you'll hear more about that from John. And then finally, uh, to, to match this mission of, of growing and expanding uh, our mission base and, and really focusing on this commercial quality uh, transition, uh, we've been focused on hiring. So as you know, we brought John on board uh, last fall uh, as our VP of engineering to lead the roadmap development and lead the development efforts of the foundation. Uh, we're now hiring a new uh, VP of uh, business development to help us with the structuring of relationships, fundraising, uh, and other key aspects uh, around that uh, uh, function so that we can uh, be a good partner in terms of bringing funds together to sponsor uh, cooperative development projects, but also access uh, philanthropic and government grant funding and other uh, funding resources to help bring the things forward. So we'll be announcing uh, next week uh, our new VP of Business Development will be joining uh, starting Monday. Uh, in addition, uh, we also have uh, a dedicated project manager uh, that will help us with both product management and project management for the platform and for various projects in the foundation. Uh, that will, person will be starting uh, in March. Uh, we've got them uh, lined up, and that's uh, time to really help us with the execution of the initiation of the development efforts for the 17.1 project. So there's a lot of things going on, a lot happening in the foundation. We're really excited uh, that we've got people here engaged and working with us on this, and I look forward to, uh, uh, to a great year. So welcome, and let me turn it back over to Keith, who can take you through today's agenda. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Do I have to change presenter? Um, maybe I can just grab it here on my own. There we go. Okay. All right. Rudy, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. I'm ready to go. Okay. Um, so uh, Rudy's going to give us an update on the two six. 2016 training program. Okay, thanks, really? Keith. Um, so as, as part of the marketing program, working closely with the community committee, um, we've got, uh, again, another exciting year coming uh, for uh, the foundation. Uh, we'll be uh, attending a number of shows, the uh, tri Molecular Medicine Tricon meeting in San Francisco, BioIT World again. Uh, we're going to be holding a special um, seminar in conjunction with the I2B2 meeting at Harvard in June. You'll be hearing a lot more about that. Uh, and we're actively working on the uh, annual meeting uh, for uh, the October time frame. So lots of things coming, and you can watch the website for uh, all this information and details uh, as it comes together. But one of the, the programs that we're really excited about is our training program. We, we kicked this off last year. We did run uh, 11 training classes. That's the last Monday of each month. Uh, free classes on uh, for new users of the foundation's platform. And we actually trained uh, 200 people last year uh, throughout the 11-month period. 
um, and this was all for free. Um, were, uh, classes donated by Rancho Bioscience and Thomson Reuters. Uh, so again this year we're going to follow that same uh, a program, although with a little bit of a modification, you can see on the website today that uh, we are going to continue to have a monthly uh, training class, um, but uh, rather than having just the Transmart for Beginners uh, class, we're going to have several other uh, classes uh, added to that, including how to load data to Transmart, um, using some of the tools that we have and some of the advanced um, uh, uh, analysis tools that are part of the system. And the training this year will be conducted by uh, member companies, uh, Rancho Bioscience, Thomson Reuters, and uh, Adding the Hive. Uh, again, they're all contributing um, their the, the classes, and um, these will be available for free. Uh, probably uh, about a 60 to 90 minute classes in general, um, and you can register today on the website for at least the first six months worth, and the rest shortly after. Um, the details of what's in these classes uh, are there. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, and all of these are going to be hosted by uh, BT uh, on their website, uh, again, donated to the, the foundation. So we think it's a really good program of classes. Um, please uh, look them over, see if you or people in your organization would be interested, and please register soon. We can handle um, you know, up to 100 people per class. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. or uh, Julie Bryant from Rancho, who is the uh, chair of the working group uh, in the community committee on training and documentation. Um, and uh, have a look, and uh, please uh, join us in some of these classes. Thank you. Hi, Rudy. Just for clarification, um, do you do we have to register for each of these individually, or is it like the uh, the community yes. calls? Okay. No, in this in this case, since we're trying to keep track of you know which these are each individual classes, and so you register for one particular class. Okay. So these are all separate registrations. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks. And a reminder, if anybody has any questions, you can use the um, control panel to uh, to raise those questions. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, take them up at the end of the program. Um, next up on the agenda, uh, John O'Hara. Let me uh, unmute you, or if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, um, is going to... Uh, review the current status of the development roadmap. John, are you there? Okay, John, I've unmuted you. Excellent, thank you. Well, thank you everybody. So as you can see, and uh, as Keith commented, uh, the 16.1 release, uh, which is now in Alpha 2, alpha two state, uh, is an active... Oh, excuse me. My apologies. Um, basically, as everybody can see, uh, we're in Alpha 2 state, and uh, that's, that's in uh, an active program. We expect on the 24th or 25th of this month to reach Alpha 3. So we're in bug fix mode right now. Uh, we're getting bug reports in, uh, mostly from internal users uh, and internal community members uh, here at Transmart. We'd like to get uh, greater uh, access to this. Um, basically, uh, you know, starting with Alpha 3, we really, really want to see a, a great community response to this. Um, target is uh, the 25th. Of, of the month for Alpha 3 and uh, from the standpoint of the next milestone uh, the, will be the beta release which will of course have to be approved by the PMC that will be on February uh, 8, 9 uh, time frame and uh, an overall goal of releasing at the end of March so the 125 project on track bug fix mode uh, you know certainly uh, at a minimum get it uh, when Alpha 3 is available, and um, you know, get get access uh, and start and start submitting bugs, that would be of great of great help. Uh, with respect to uh, the 16.2 release, which is uh, actively now in the development stage, uh, we are conducting meetings with uh, the community to talk about the readiness of the source code that is a potential for contribution. Uh, is Keith Nagel and Keith Ellison mentioned there is a hackathon taking place uh, right now at uh, hosted by the Hive with um, 
with uh, contributions and, and input from Sanofi and, uh, and uh, Pfizer and also from the University of Luxembourg. So we're working diligently to get the uh, Smart R functionality uh, you know, over the finish line so that that can go into the into the 16.2 release. The same is about to happen for uh, imaging. We are looking to normalize a couple of different plugins for XNAT and uh, that's also a potential for inclusion. A third area for uh, potential inclusion is the GWAS support that's being donated by Pfizer. Uh, those meetings will be coming up in the next a week to two weeks. And then last, uh, I think everybody knows we'd like to include some changes to the ICE tool so that we have a better mechanism for loading data and something that is a bit more graphical than what exists today. So uh, those ICE extensions are the fourth leg of the stool for the 16.2 release. All of these are in readiness assessment stage for inclusion in the release. So we're working with the different community members who are donating the code. So uh, that is that is ongoing and that is getting a tremendous amount of support. If you have code to uh, potentially be included in the 16.2 release that is targeted for the third quarter of this year, we'd certainly like to hear about it. So if you've got something that you'd like to contribute, uh, you know, certainly reach out to Keith Nagel and uh, and you know we'll schedule a review of it and and get it in. Also, if you have any comments on XNAT, on Smart R, on at the ICE tool product productization, or uh, on GWAS support, please let us know. So those are the uh, activities that are taking place for 16.2. On 17.1, uh, there's a tremendous amount of activity in the background uh, as we work with both Harvard and the Hive and our community members around the definition of the functionality in this release. So as everyone knows, we are working with Harvard to reintegrate the I2B2 functionality in the release and that is making great progress. Uh, we've got some, some great feedback from the Harvard team on uh, manpower loading, project costs, etc. and so we're feeling quite comfortable with that uh, for inclusion. And then on the uh, you know genomics data front, uh, we're working diligently with Hive and community members like Roche, Pfizer, Sanofi, and others to talk about uh, what the functionality, the use cases for the queries would be, and also on what would be the use cases for the storage and 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 warehousing of the data. So those are ongoing uh, now. Uh, we've also had at, the, at this point, uh, thanks to some introductions, some very, very good discussions with the Genomics Alliance team, and uh, we expect quite a bit of work there to on the on a going forward basis as we scope out what is happening with 17.1. So overall, the programs look all to be in relatively good shape. Uh, you know, we'll certainly be briefing the board next week uh, more fully on those programs and looking for feedback from them. So Keith, with that, um, I'll turn it back over to you. I think we've covered everything that I intended to cover. All right, thanks, John. Um, all right, so uh, next up on the agenda, again, uh, the goal for this month's meeting was to focus a bit on data. There's been quite a bit of activity uh, both during and, and since the annual meeting in Amsterdam. And so we'd like to present that, show you the current state of uh, the curated data that's available, how to get access to it, how to get it loaded. Um, and uh, Peter Rice is going to walk us through that and then talk a little bit about the futures, what's uh, what's on the horizon in terms of curated data. And then again, we'd like to uh, get the community involved and find out what your needs are and and what you might have, uh, have available to donate to the community. So with that, um, Peter, if you can unmute yourself. And I will drive the slides. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, there you are. Lovely. So we go to the next slide, please. Okay. So we have a, a bunch of uh, curated data available already for use in Transmart. Uh, those of you who are in Amsterdam remember Julie Bryant had a memory stick with a bunch of all the data that have been contributed to the 1.2 uh, development to date. Um, 
available on a memory stick and we have all that available for upload. We've also had contributions from Sanofi. So they had a set of da test data for all of the data types that they supported in their um, RC2 developments that were contributed to Transmart 1.2. And we have all of those available. Um, so you can use them for testing data types and we can use them on demonstration servers. Uh, the guys at CTM Trait Project at the um, menu at the Hive, I believe, have contributed an update to the cell line use case, which again contributes multiple data types and test cases, and we can use these for um, a lot of testing on standard ways on standard sets of data. And we have um, contributions of GWAS data from Pfizer and contributed, I believe, um, curated by Rancho, that we can use to work on the, the GWAS um, capabilities and getting those fully up to speed on Postgres and updated for 16.2. Next slide, please. So as I say, there are a lot of supported data types. At the um, content committee meeting in uh, Amsterdam, we made a list of the data types that uh, we knew of, and it grew longer and longer and went up to the, the bottom of the board. Um, so in addition to clinical data and gene expression, which we typically see, we have um, mass spec proteomics and rules-based medicine proteomics, RNA-seq data, microRNA data from qPCR and RNA-seq experiments, metabolomics data, uh, copy number variation for um, array CGH, and uh, at least SNP data from VCF files of variation. Uh, and we have example data sets for all of these that we can use um, to check ETLs uh, to improve performance as we go through. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the link at the top is the wiki page that describes all of this. If you just go to the Transmart wiki and type curated data, it will take you straight there. So no need to, to remember the whole thing. This page is getting longer and longer. It's a list of all of the studies for which we have curated data that's been contributed and a note of where you'll be able to download them. Some of these um, ETLs have had to be updated just a little bit for uh, the 16.1 release. So it's best to wait for 16.1 or you may find some of them don't quite work. Um, some fields need to be made bigger. A couple of procedures were missing for incremental data loading and, and small fixes like that. Most things would work perfectly well with the previous 1.2.4 release. Um, all of these data sets have been tested on Postgres and Oracle. So we've loaded them up and tested them using Transmart data, which uses the native Kettle scripts. And I'll show you a little how the Transmart data loading works in a moment. We're also looking at uh, Thomson Reuters data loader um, and checking whether we can make the data compatible with that uh, for the same set of data and looking at the ICE tool, which again uses the standard uh, Kettle scripts and uh, checking the latest release on Oracle and Postgres. Um, we have a good source of uh, test data set now to check that on all data types. Uh, next slide, please. So this is how the Transmart data loading works. You need a copy of Transmart, uh, the Transmart data repository. You um, edit the VARS file, which basically just says where your database is. You make this update data sets target, which is the list of all the data sets you can load. And then you can, um, the next lines load up clinical data. You type load clinical and hit tab and it gives you a list of all of the studies that you can load. Uh, the ones curated by Rancho are currently are, are labeled Rancho. The ones curated by other groups are labeled with those groups and then the study name. Uh, most studies we only have once, a few we may, might have more than once and you just need to load one copy. And that's basically it and you can obviously script those. The first one loads the clinical data for the study. The second one looks up the uh, platform for the expression data. Oops, sorry. And, uh, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. But the second one just finds out what the platform is for the expression data and checks whether it's loaded. And if it isn't, it goes off and fetches it. And then the third one loads the expression data. So if you know what you're doing, you can skip the one in between, but it only takes a few seconds to go through. So that's normally the three that you would run. Sometimes there's more than one platform for expression data, in which case there are, there are two or three reference annotations to load and maybe two or three expression data sets to load. But that's basically it. The, the uh, wiki page that I mentioned gives you a list of all the targets that are available. Um, we'll be working on a, a standard set that we can use for testing 
um, all the functionality for all of the data types using this method of loading. Uh, now the next slide, please. So in Amsterdam, there was a call at the content meeting for people to contribute more data. Uh, Peter Dressler from Elevada slipped me a memory stick during the meeting with five geo studies for um, AML, which I'm currently working on loading. Um, they're pretty much there. I got uh, more than 50 geo studies from the Utrix public server promised by Wegu, which I got the, um, a couple of days later from him. Um, also four studies from TCGA, um, Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia, and some data from GSK Cell Lines. There's quite a wide disease coverage with a focus on Parkinson's and rheumatoid arthritis, which I think was partly connected to the datathon last year. And all of those are available for loading. Currently, when you load these, they come up as eTrix studies or Elevada studies so that you can pick them up by source. Um, one um, way that we'd like some input from the community is how best to label these so that if you load all these studies, they will look nice in Transmart and you'll be able to find what you want. Whether you have disease at the top level or the original source at the top level, I'd welcome feedback. Um, lots of things that you can do to help that don't involve a vast amount of work. You're not committing yourself to very much, but your, your opinions count and will be extremely valuable. Could I have the next slide, please? It's really a list of people who are at the meeting and have promised more things, and they include eTrix, where as more data appears on the eTrix public server, we expect those to be contributed uh, to this set of curated data. So eTrix has a commitment to add more, more studies in the coming year, and so we'll watch out for new ones and put them in as well. Also, other, other contributors have been offering things, and we're looking at getting some more GWAS data from public sources. Uh, just looking into the licensing to make sure it's, it doesn't say that we can't is the current verdict. Uh, next slide, please. Another um, part of this that I'm working on with the University of Luxembourg, guys from eTrix with Wegu and others, is looking at the browse tab metadata. So having loaded these studies up, there's currently not been a way to populate the browse tab. So I have a, a prototype loading script that uses just a a text file with the description and the other attributes for the browse tab and we'd be able to load that automatically onto any server along with the data. Um, the scripts are currently just a, a prototype script in Perl. They need to be converted into something more robust and better maintainable um, when we do that for the 16.2 release. But initially at least we'll be able to share browse tab metadata and share information on the curation. I'm looking for some feedback on, on how best to annotate these studies. I can pull a lot of the data from Geo for Geo studies, but not everything that I need. And I'll, I'd like a bit of a expert help there from anyone who's willing to contribute. Uh, next slide, please. So as I say, we're hoping to have a set of standard data sets that we can use. We have a, a set of um, test scripts which have some studies that they use repeatedly as example use cases and we have the training servers where there are some use cases that are, appear repeatedly in the courses and we'll try to support those primarily. Um, I'd like to be able to load these with multiple ETL procedures so we can check the kettle scripts, we can check the TR, Thomson Reuters data loader and check transport batch and other methods and, and make sure that they're all doing the right thing with the data. And then we can uh, going forward have a much much better curated and better documented and understood set of ETLs. Also setting up some testing servers to support uh, automated testing, so loading a, a set of standard studies, and we'll do these repeatedly, um, and therefore we'll always have the ETL scripts tested and uh, we'll know that they're working. Next slide, please. <laughs> so as I say, we'd like to automatically test these, testing the pipelines, um, automatically testing analysis using these uh, test data sets, checking the querying of the, the browse tab metadata, checking the query capabilities in the analyze tab, checking how the data appears in the grid view, and make, using these to make sure that the data is being loaded correctly. So if we have these tests set up and we run the ETL again, um, if the data is loaded correctly, all of these tests should pass as well. 
I'd also like to be able to test error conditions so that we know if you have an error in your ETLs, um, one that I've come across is that the, uh, the description for a node is just too long to fit in the database. Um, how to find these and how to rapidly find out what the error is and where to fix it would be good. So introducing some of these where we know them and uh, get a standard message back and make sure that that's the message we get and being able to document that would be very helpful and documenting it for each of the ETLs where it can arise. Otherwise, quite often, users can find themselves staring at a failed ETL and it's quite stressful and frustrating trying to work out why it hasn't worked. And the cause is usually simple once you find out what it was. And next one. So just some things for the future, things to consider, particularly for 16.2. Um, automating testing across all of the data types. So Samantha Lipsky at AbbVie is collecting information on the data types and the ETLs that people are using. And uh, we'll be gathering that up into um, an automated testing and improving the quality for each of these. Having then a set of supported ETL pipelines that we believe are good and we like for Transmart. Having some information about the other methods that people are using to load data. I'm sure there are many and varied out there in the community. Um, trying to gather up data curation guidelines from those who've curated data and what they recommend as important points. And closer integration of all of the ETL pipelines, so those that are using Kettle scripts, making sure they're using the same copy of the Kettle scripts, including the ICE tool and Transmart data. And checking that what each of these does in terms of validation is, is closely matched. This is something that the Transmart batch developers have asked me about in the past can we work out what all of the current ETL procedures do in detail so that we can make sure Transmart Batch can cover the same things and maybe better or faster. And obviously a lot of these, we could welcome a lot of community involvement, um, even if it's just sharing how you do your ETLs and how we can help to support you would be extremely useful. I think that's the last slide. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Um, before we get to a, a more general discussion, um, we have a question uh, from Celia Alvarez. Uh, how do you load the data by Postgres? And Celia, what I, I think what I'll do is I'll unmute you so that you can uh, go ahead and join the conversation. Hello, Celia. Oh, I guess she's muted. Um, Celia, can you unmute, unmute yourself? Uh, she says no, she can't. So uh, tell you what, we'll follow up with you uh, afterwards uh, as a separate thread. Okay. Um, well, that's a shame, Celia. I've enjoyed having your emails in the past. I was hoping we could talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, not sure what's going on there. I don't seem to be able to unmute her uh, from this end. So, um, so I guess uh, at this point, I'm not sure if there's anybody on the call who hasn't already been involved uh, with the content committee and been involved in this process. But if so, um, this was just an opportunity to get some feedback from you as to what sorts of data you'd be interested in seeing uh, in this list. Uh, let's say if we if we do this again in six months' time. Uh, what would you like to see here, um, whether it's something in the public domain or something that you yourself uh, feel you can contribute? And maybe if you need help with some of the mechanics or the curation, um, that sort of thing, maybe we can uh, we can talk about that. So if uh, if anybody's out there, you can raise your hand using the control panel. Oh, we have Nitin Dio here. Uh, Nitin, I'm going to unmute you so that you can uh, join the conversation. So, Nitin, would you like to uh, ask your question? Hello, Nitin, can you hear me? He's posting he doesn't have a microphone. Ah, okay. Oh, He's there he is. He doesn't have a mic. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Scroll down. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, mute you again just to make sure. Um, all right. Uh, so, so, Nitin, you, you asked how the raw data is curated. Um, this is where I'd like to get curation guidelines from people and get some information about uh, what's been done from the, 
the geodata to what is actually uh, being loaded if there are any extra steps. And I'm hoping we can gather those up. It'll be in the, the next six months or so, I would guess, by the time we've gathered all the information. Hmm. Um, but yes, this is this is what I meant by the, the data curation guidelines. So then we have some we have some guidelines on the wiki. If you look under um, the the uh, data curation ETL pages, um, there are some guidelines that were contributed by the Etrix uh, project and that sort of thing. Um, obviously, you know, there's different ways to to handle any given set of data, but uh, uh, to the extent that we can come to some common agreements, that would be that would make it easier to share share the work. Um, all right. Let's see, anyone else raising their hand? Not yet. Um, yeah, Jay asks, are we tracking downloads of uh, the data files? Uh, we don't have a, a formal server set up, but we will have very soon. So they're downloaded from one of the current servers. And I would guess there's some tracking. But once we have a, a nice address with, with proper letters in it, something.transportfoundation.org will be able to track the data downloads there hmm. and know which are the, the popular data sets from the contributions. Uh, Nitin asks about geospatial data. Um, I'm not aware of anything in on that side, hmm. specifically as geospatial data, but there may be some information in uh, some of the data sets. Unless you mean geospatial data of who's downloading the data, we'll be able to collect that. Oh, right. Maybe that's. No answer. Um, so, Peter, one thing I was curious about. I mean, when you when you go out and look at the licensing or consent terms for these data sets, are you finding it difficult to get that information uh, to determine whether we're actually Usually it's fine. So for the geo data sets, it's, it's, it's clear that these are out there. Um, I was looking at the GWAS data sets from abroad, and I couldn't find anything that actually said what you can do. It mm. just says we're making them available. Um, and I'd like to find something that actually says what the license is yeah. um, so that you know what you can actually do with the data. I've tried looking at the original publications to see what they say you can do with the data, and they didn't say either. Mm. Um, but I think it's a case of asking them. But it is critical. We, one thing we know in the foundation is it's critical when you release data to be able to say what you can do with the data. Right. Um, if you say you can do anything with it, it's important to say so. And we're looking to, to be able to put that kind of licensing on the data we distribute so that it's clear what can be done from then on. Right. Yeah, I was thinking, for example, about you know the Wellcome Trust uh, Case control consortium. Those would seem to be, you know, useful data sets. But uh, I'm not sure what the licensing terms are for those. Hey Keith, just one thing to step in. Uh, this is Keith. Um, one of the key issues around data is that the intellectual property rights protection around data is quite different uh, from software and from documentation. Uh, and the key is is that documentation and software are works of authorship and are protected by copyright law, which is internationally recognized, uh, whereas data is typically uh, considered a compilation of facts and not a work of authorship and is typically not subject to copyright protection. This is a key issue that the Legal Affairs Working Group is working on, is how can we make data more accessible and more available uh, while managing some of the intellectual property concerns. Um, if you will note that uh, Julie and the Legal Affairs Working Group worked together to put a sort of a bundled data threats agreement together that says that it's your responsibility to figure out what your rights are. But in general, unless you have to sign a contract to get data, um, it's free for any use. It's open data. Uh, typical data that you need to sign a, a, an agreement to access due to patient consents and other kinds of issues, you'll have to sign a contract, and that contract is between you and the owner of the data. Uh, so it's a, it's a complex issue, but the data that's going up uh, on the Transmart site uh, I think is all open data, and uh, there's a bundled license agreement that basically says that if there are any requirements there that uh, you figure those out on your own. Uh, but I would suspect that, that all these data are open data. 
We are working with a number of groups uh, like the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the Laboratory of Neuroimaging, uh, the Parkinson Study Group uh, to make data that is subject to uh, contract uh, available in Transmark formats. But uh, the current strategy for that is that you would have to go to the data owner to get those Transmark formatted data. So you'll hear more about that in the coming months, but uh, that's how we're working with people that have data that requires uh, authorization to gain access to. Okay. All right, Alex, uh, I've unmuted you. I see that you've raised your hand. Do you have a question? Hey, hello. Um, yeah, so on a little bit of a different note, sorry, it's kind of loud here. Um, I actually finished internally updating all the scripts, the test scripts for Transmart internally, so I'm looking to clean them up, and I wanted to reconcile with you guys making sure that the test scripts that I'm using for the data sets are the same, or actually ones that you guys can use. So like you were talking about the geo studies and stuff like that, so I think I'd probably have to coordinate with Peter um, just to make sure everything's okay. Excellent, yes. Cool, thanks. Okay, thanks Alex. All right, are there any other questions, comments, uh, offers of help, offers of data uh, before we wrap up? All right. I don't see anyone at this point. Um, all right. Uh, if there are no other questions, then uh, I think we'll we finish up a little early today. I give you back 15 minutes, and I'd like to uh, you know do this again at an appropriate time, maybe six months uh, hence, and we'll just cover what's new in the data landscape, uh, so that this is a, a recurring uh, event, um, just to keep everybody updated on what's happening. Uh, in this in this field so all right uh, with that I will wrap it up and uh, look forward to seeing you in February that's great thanks Keith thanks okay. everyone thanks everyone